my older son, Joel, could work for the CIA. Joel keeps everything in. Everything's plain close to vest. When you ask him, you know, he'll come home from school, hey son, how was your day? Fine. Well, you know, like, uh, how was lunch? Good. <laughs> Who'd you sit with today? The normal. <laughs> so, like, anything happened today? Like, anything different? Hey, no. Come on, give me something. David's a little better, but even David, he's got a lunch crew. And, so, what'd you guys talk about today? I don't remember. It was like three hours ago. How, how do you not remember what you talked about? Um, I always want to get information about my boys. So, David, I have this thing with his friends come over. I'll say to them, like, I'm trying to remember, what's the name of David's girlfriend again? As far as I know, he doesn't have a girlfriend. See, this is. So, when they look at me and they're like, David has a girlfriend? I'm like, okay, just, just checking because I don't know if he's going to tell me or not. The fact is, I love to talk with my boys. I want to know what's going on inside of them. I want to know what they're thinking and how their life is going. And I just want to know them better. You know, the fact is, God feels the same way about us. He wants us to reveal ourselves to him. It's not that God doesn't know. Unlike me, I don't often know what's going on with my boys. God always knows, but he wants us to come to him, to bring him our needs and our wants and our issues and our struggles, because he loves us and wants to hear what we have to say. So this morning we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 11. As we look at prayer and the importance of bringing our requests to God. We're doing kind of a, a quick flyover of the book of Mark. This is the, a book of the Bible I could spend years in. And uh, actually, Matthew and Luke, you may know, are, are very similar. Many times the passages are almost exactly the same. And I've preached on many of the things in Mark when I was preaching on Matthew or Luke. So I'm just hitting some of the major points. And so today we're jumping into Mark 11, beginning in verse 20. We read this. In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. So earlier in Mark 11... They're walking by a fig tree, it's got leaves, it looks healthy, and Jesus is hungry and goes over to grab a fig and finds the tree has no fruit whatsoever. And so Jesus curses the tree and says, may you never again bear fruit. Now Jesus was not in the habit, just to be clear, of walking around and, you know, oh, this, this thing doesn't have any food on it, I'm going to curse it. But the reality is he actually used it as an example to talk about Israel. But here he curses it, and uh, the next day they come, and Peter looks and goes, whoa, Jesus, look at that tree. It's withered from the roots. This is important, because trees drop leaves all the time. So if it dropped the leaves, it still might be, hmm, something doesn't look good, but it still might survive. This one clearly is dead. And so Jesus says to Peter, have faith in God. Jesus answered, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. So it just begins by telling him, have faith in God. Again, he's shocked. Peter's like, wow, that actually worked, Jesus. And he's like, of course it did. And so um, he says, truly I tell you, and this is kind of Jesus' way of saying, listen up. You know, truly, I tell you, is, hey, I'm going to tell you something important here. And he then talks about the fact that uh, when we pray that God listens. He says, if anyone says this mountain, go throw yourself in the sea, and does not doubt, but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Now, there's the Mount of Olives. Maybe he's talking about there. If you've actually been to Jerusalem, there's mountains all around. Maybe he pointed to one across the way. Now, Jesus' point was not that, hey, we, we're going to move mountains. His point was similar to our idea. In that time, the people would say, talk about mountains in their lives. In the same way we would say, like, yeah, I've got this mountain I'm facing, and it's really tough. And the idea here is that we can go to God in prayer and trust in him. When Jesus says have faith in God, he means that we need to constantly trust and live in dependence on him. <coughs> We should not interpret what Jesus says here to mean if we pray really, really hard and just believe hard enough, then God must answer our prayer no matter what. Some preachers teach really we should have faith in faith. In other words, faith in us having enough faith that God has to do it. As Pastor Warren Wearsby points out, though, we need to remember this is not the only lesson that the Bible gives on prayer, that Jesus gives on prayer. And so we have to be careful not to isolate it from the rest of Scripture. 1 John 5.14 says something similar. It says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything, he hears us. 
Anyone notice I missed a piece of that? If we ask anything what? According to his will. This is the part of the passage we don't really like. You know, Lord, I'm just going to scratch out anything according to your will. And just, hey, he does kind of whatever I want. That is quite honestly what we normally want. And yet that's not the way it works. And so we have to understand that there are times when we pray, we don't really know what to pray for. And that's when we pray that God lets your will be done. Not mine. That's what Jesus prayed. Not my will, but yours be done. But then there's times for authoritative prayer. When we know that God wants to do something. You're struggling with sin. You're tempted. You don't have to be like, Lord, if you're willing to help me. God wants to help you every single time you're struggling with sin. Lord, I'm going to share my faith with someone. Will you help me? Of course he wants to help you. God wants to draw that person to himself. These are times for authoritative prayer. We know what God's will is. We just need to pray his resources into the situation. But you may be wondering, how do I pray a mountain-moving prayer? The key is to focus not on the mountain, but on the power of God. He is bigger than whatever it is you're facing. There probably isn't a person here who doesn't have some kind of mountain in their life right now or recently. Maybe it's a troubled marriage, a destructive sin or habit, a physical problem, a financial worry, a character flaw, problems with school, the list goes on. And maybe you've tried to fix it. Maybe you've tried to overcome your mountain. Maybe you've even prayed, you've told God about it. Well, I want to encourage you, get your eyes off the mountain and onto God. In the midst of life, when we face struggles, if we just focus on the problem, it can seem so overwhelming. When we focus on God, it becomes smaller and smaller. And also, when we focus on God, we realize this, that when we work, we work. When we pray, God works. And so we always have to do our part, but we need God to step in. Do what only God can do. And he does answer prayer. But the best thing about a thriving prayer life is not just that God answers your prayers, but that you grow to know him better and more intimately and have a deeper relationship. But we've probably all faced times when God didn't answer our prayers. And the normal question we ask is, why, Lord, why? In his book, Too Busy Not to Pray, Bill Hybels, who's a well-known speaker, pastor, and author, Suggests a little outline for people whose prayers are not being answered, and I'm going to borrow it this morning. He says, when you feel like your prayers are not being answered, the first thing is this. If the request is wrong, then God says no. See, your prayer request may be good intention, but it might be inappropriate. And God's going to say no to that. Disciples were not above asking for something with the wrong motives. Remember last week, we looked at James and John. They come to Jesus, hey, will you do something for us? He's like, what is it? We want to be your right and left-hand men. We want to be the most important people in your kingdom. Jesus answered them, no. Sometimes we don't get answered to prayer because our motives are wrong. Another occasion, Jesus' disciples, they're traveling through a Samaritan village, and James and John are angry. They were turned away. And so if they suggested to Jesus that he should just call down fire, destroy the village, and Jesus rebukes the request. Sometimes we're praying for things that are just not in God's will for our lives. We shouldn't be like the little boy who, was, after taking his geography test, prayed, Dear Lord, please let Newark be the capital of New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> you ever kind of have that, though? You're like, you know, like, Lord, somehow change it so that, you know, what's wrong becomes right. That's not what we do. So the question is this. When you pray, what's your motive? It's certainly a good thing to ask God to help you at your job, but if your goal is simply so you can be wealthy and live a lavish lifestyle and show off to everyone how amazing you are, then God's probably not going to honor that. So how do you pray with the right motive? Well, first of all, ask this question. Would it bring glory to God? Secondly, would it advance his kingdom? Third, would it help people? And fourth, would it help me grow spiritually? And if the answer to these are all no, no, and they're just really a selfish prayer, then don't be surprised when God says no. Well, there's a second thing. Sometimes if the timing is wrong, God will say slow. We have to understand that sometimes we get ahead of God's timing. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So sometimes God has a different plan from the plan that we have. And so he's just saying slow. You know, just wait. Trust me. And that's hard for us to do. It's hard for us to be patient. 
in prayer. We want things now. We want it today. You're part of our church. You've been around. You know I uh, had a tumor that was removed a little over two weeks ago. And it started about three months ago. I'm at my dentist's office, and the dental hygienist says to me, Mark, what's this lump in your cheek? I don't know. She's like, well, how long have you had it? I'm like, God, why would I notice something like that? Like, oh, maybe six months. Like, it's just, you know, I can feel there's something small. So she calls the dentist in. He looks at it, and he says, you've got to get this looked at, Mark. So the next day, I see an oral surgeon. He says, it's at the parotid gland. I can't mess with that. You need to go to an ear, nose, and throat person. So I then get an ear, nose, and throat person. And um, the bottom line is they want to do surgery immediately. They haven't checked up on it. They haven't done anything else. And I call my primary care physician I really trust. He said, Mark, you need to get someone good. He's like, this ENT just does surgery on the side. And so he said, here's who I would send my family to. So he sends me to Morristown Hospital to this top surgeon, the head of their face and neck surgery, who, sent, who when I call the office, they say, we can get you an appointment in five weeks. <laughs> five weeks, Russ. I go, okay. So I get my appointment in five weeks, and they're like, okay, we'll do a follow-up, like a CAT scan in a couple of weeks. And after that, we'll do a biopsy a couple of weeks later. And I'm going like, didn't they mention possibly a cancer? Like, would faster maybe be better? Like, just... So I'm trying to push them to hurry things up. And as um, a matter of fact, so finally they schedule surgery. And they're looking at the maybe beginning of July. And I'm saying to them, like, beginning of July does not work for me. The week after is vacation Bible school. And Frankie, I said, I gotta, and I told him, I said, listen, I got a vacation Bible school leader. I do games. I've been doing games for the past 18 years. If I have to call and tell him I will not be there that week, this guy is going to just have a heart attack on me. We've we got to do this sooner. So thank you to Vacation Bible School. They squeezed me in sooner, and um, they, they did the surgery. It took a lot longer than they thought it would, and was a lot more entailed. And because during the surgery, it looked like it was possibly cancer. So the surgeon, and thankfully he biopsied it and took a lot more. So he took as much, really, he said to me this week, he just left the skin and a little bit of fatty layer. He said, I really took everything I possibly could. So he said, we're biopsying it, and we'll let you know. It should be about a week. So this is Friday, two weeks, a little over two weeks ago. So I waited a week, and really, God's presence was so wonderful, and I was calm. Those who know me, I wasn't freaking out. I wasn't, it's like, if it's cancer, it's cancer. I, I, I'm a man of God, but it doesn't mean bad things don't happen. So, but I'm just going to trust him. So Friday comes, and I call their office. I'm like, hey, he said the report should be in today. And they're like, it's not. So I call later in the day, it's still not. So then I get to wait Saturday, Sunday, Monday I call. No, Mark, we still don't have it. Tuesday I go see the surgeon. Thankfully you're gonna see the surgeon. They're gonna have the results. I go see the surgeon. No, they do not have the results. So I'm saying to him like, I've been waiting a long time here. You know, you told me Friday, it's Tuesday. Like, when am I gonna get these results? He's like, well, we sent it to an outside pathologist. Ends up, they sent it to phone catering. And so he's like, you know, I don't know. And so I said, so what, it could be Friday? Next Monday? He's like, or it could be an hour from now. Like, well, yeah, it could be an hour from now. Or it could have been yesterday, or the day before, or the day before that. But I just, I said, okay. And I went home, and I just had to again say, Lord, this is not my timing, but I'm just going to trust in you. And I'm just going to rest in you. And often in prayer, God doesn't give us exactly what we want when we want it. You know, I wanted it to come back early. I wanted them to call me like four days later and be like, wow, it's crazy, but our people were really slow and said, let's just get this biopsy done right now. <laughs> Friends, sometimes in your prayer, God's going to tell you slow. We want it now, but we have to trust that he knows the perfect timing. Third thing is this. If you're wrong, then God will say grow. Maybe the reason God hasn't answered your prayer is because you need to be obedient to him first. Maybe you've only prayed about it once or twice. Maybe you haven't really been expecting God to do anything. Maybe God's not answering your prayer because there's some things you need to clear up first with Him. Hybels gives the example of, says, imagine you've gone away on vacation for three weeks. You come back, it ends up your lawn guy had hurt himself and has not been able to mow your lawn, and now it's like this thick. And you've got your little Kmart mower, and you know it cannot handle that grass, but your next door neighbor has this huge John Deere riding mower, top of the line, and he's always told you, hey, anytime you want to borrow it, feel free. So you're walking over to his house and ask if you can borrow it, and his little dog comes up, and you hate this dog. It's a yappy little thing. It goes in your yard and does its business. It's just obnoxious, and it's nipping at you, and it's biting at your pants, and so you just give it a little kick. To get it out of the way. It yelps and runs off, and as you look up, who do you see right there? 
but your neighbor. So Hybels asks, would this be a good time to ask for a favor? Or is there maybe something you need to clear up first? We come to God in prayer. If there's unconfessed sin, if there's things in our lives we've not handed over to Him, we need to do that. And so that's the first thing that can hamper our prayers is unconfessed sin. Isaiah 59 2 says this Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear you. So is God not listening? It might just be that there's sin in your life that you are unwilling to hand over to Him. And you need to surrender now. Another thing that can be, uh, can hamper our prayers is unresolved conflict. This passage in Mark, verse 25, he said this, And when you, are, when you stand praying, Jesus says, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that, your heavenly father, so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Sometimes the reason our Heavenly Father doesn't hear us is because we are holding on to grudges and hurts, and that person did this thing, and we're refusing to forgive. And it can destroy our spiritual life. Now, there are times when we have done what we can. We've gone, we've apologized, we've tried to reconcile the relationship. God understands that. The Bible's clear, it says that we're to live at peace with others as much as it depends on us. So in other words, some people don't want to live at peace with you, and that's a whole different story. But if there's someone you need to forgive, then you have to let that go. Another thing that can hamper our prayers is an inadequate faith. Sometimes we just don't believe God can really do it. We're struggling with something. We just don't really feel like handing it over to him because we think we've got to take control of this. We think we have to be the ones to do it. In Mark 11, Jesus said in our passage, he said, Have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, Go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you've received it and it will be yours. So when you're praying and asking God for something, you can't be like, well, Lord, if it's possible for you to pull it off. Now, again, you can pray, Lord, your will be done. But it's never a matter of God's not powerful enough. Maybe, can he do it? He always is able. It's as this part of his plan. So sometimes God answers our prayers by saying we need to grow. But the fourth thing is this. If the request is right, if the timing is right, and you are right, God says go. You see, the Lord loves to honor the prayer requests of his people. He wants to give good gifts to his children, any good parent. And there's joy. When you give your child something that they want that makes them happy, that brings me joy. And your Heavenly Father wants to give you great things. So when your request is right, timing is right, your heart is right, God says go. And he answers the prayer. Just this week, we had an update from Deb Hopkins. Bill sent us two updates. She saw the doctor, two different doctors, and... She maybe knew she was carrying around this big, heavy battery pack, basically, that was like an external defibrillator. And they discovered her heart is strong enough and everything is good, and she does not need to have surgery to add something, nor does she have to carry this pack around. Then she's had this infection that from her heart surgery. She had major surgery and this big infection that she was battling, and that's gone, and she, everything's <coughs> going great. And so God is good. He's answered prayer. Again, not in our time. It took a lot longer than they would have wanted. But God heard our cry and answered our prayer. But your next question might be this. How then do I pray? What do I pray? Well, just quickly, in Matthew 6, verses 9 to 13, Jesus gives us our outline. He says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This has been broken down into uh, four letters. Many of you have heard this before, Acts. We've talked about it. Um, and the first part of this is adoration. Jesus says that when we pray, what do we pray? Our Father in heaven, hallowed, holy is your name. So the first part of prayer is so many of us, when we go to pray, we just go right and go, okay, dear God, I want this, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want this, I want that. How would you feel if your child came to you like that? If your spouse came to you like that? If your parents came to you, you haven't seen them in a while, they came and said, oh, hey, honey, and you go, and they start going, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. Our Heavenly Father wants a relationship. The first thing is adoration. That is exalting Him for who He is. Not for the stuff he's given you. Hey, thanks for the house. That's later. 
But this is just, Lord, for your, your goodness, for your holiness. For the fact that I can trust in you always, for who you are. That's adoration. One way to do this is pray through the Psalms. Many of them are just praise to God. The C in Acts stands for confession. Jesus says, forgive us our debts as we forgive those in debt to us. And so this is where we come to God and we say, Lord, I'm sorry I have sinned, I have done wrong. Now some people like just blank and confession. Lord, for anything I've done in the past you know, years, Sorry. How would that work if you're having a conflict with maybe your spouse or your parents or your kids? Or, hey, if I did anything wrong, you know, sorry. Is, are they going to go, oh, thanks so much. Wow, the way you know. You've got to be specific, Lord. I lied to that person yesterday. I know it's wrong. Forgive me. Father, I have not been spending time with you. Forgive me. So we confess what we've done. The T in Acts stands for Thanksgiving. And so now we thank him for the things he's done specifically for us. Lord, thank you my kids are healthy. Thank you I have a nice home to live in. Thank you things at the job are going well. We thank him for what he's done. And then the S is for supplication. I'm sorry, within Thanksgiving, <coughs> Psalm 100 tells us, Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, praise his name. So we thank him. And then supplication, we see in Philippians 4, 6, it says, In everything... By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Why? Because God cares. Because he wants to hear what's happening in your life. So pray for your marriage. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for our church. Pray for your health. Pray for your holiness. Pray for your job, your family, your school. God cares. He wants to hear. Now, the truth is, supplication, this is the part of prayer we tend to be good at. You know, asking for stuff. But again, as you're asking, think about things beyond yourself, your own life. About the needs of others around you and lift them up to him. Now, I want to close by just giving a couple suggestions about prayer. When you pray, the first thing is this. You must rely on the Holy Spirit. God wants this relationship with you. And so it's coming to him and asking him to reveal himself, asking his spirit to bring his power and his life into you. The second thing is this, make time to pray. You know what? I guarantee there's almost never going to be a time that things are so slow that you're going to go, wow, I have an hour to pray today. Because what are you going to do with that hour? You're probably going to turn on your television or go to your phone or your computer or a book or something else. So you have to set aside time. This is where maybe you need to go to bed earlier at night so you can get up a half an hour earlier in the morning. But you've got to set aside that time to pray. It normally won't happen on its own. And then finally, find a quiet place to pray. You know, I would not encourage you to make your prayer time in your kitchen in the morning when everyone's getting ready for school and for work. You're not going to be able to focus. So maybe there's a closet. If you have a walk-in closet, first of all, I'm jealous. But uh, secondly, that may be a great place. Bring a chair in there. Or maybe you've got an office or a back room, but just somewhere quiet where you can be alone with God and focus on Him. Because here's the thing, God wants to talk to His children. <clears throat> he loves you, and prayer is conversation, it's, it's, it's sharing with Him our hearts and just stopping, reading His Word, listening to what He has to say to us. Because He is a God who cares. You know, I asked God when I prayed, Lord, let this not be cancer. His answer was no. Got back the results on Thursday, talked to the surgeon, and it was cancer. So that piece of my prayer, God didn't answer. Now I'm a pastor. I mean, I can see him not answering your prayers. I mean, <laughs> some of you are Giants fans. I mean, sure, God's not going to listen to you. But I'm a pastor. The fact is, God says no. I wanted to find out quickly. Five days, Lord, six, maybe seven. God says 12 Actually, 13 before I talked to the doctor. The answer was slow. You know, as I was forced to wait on God, I think his answer was grow. Just trust me, Mark. Rest and trust me. And the great news is this. I don't need any treatments. They think they got all of the, the tumor. Everything looks good around it. The edges are good. And uh, it was also what's called a low-grade cancer, not aggressive. Um, the doctor really, other than the word cancer, that's a bad word. You don't want that word. But other than that, really everything else he had to say was very positive. Looks like no radiation treatments, nothing. So God did hear my prayers. I will say he didn't answer exactly the way I planned. 
but he was in charge. And so many of you prayed for me, and I want to say thank you. Just know God does hear our prayers. Again, he doesn't always answer things the way we would have done it. But guess what? He's in charge. We're not. And God's greatest goal in our lives is to make us like Christ. You know, without hard times, we probably wouldn't be who we could be. Struggles and problems draw us closer to God. So trust in him. And when you pray, know he's listening. Sometimes you go, God, it's not happening the way I planned. And he says, yeah, because it's not your plan. Trust in your Father who loves you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for being a God who cares about us. I'm so thankful that we serve a Lord who loves his children and wants to hear from us. God, you want us to even bring our needs, our wants, our wishes, and lay them down before you. I pray that we as a church would be people of prayer who know and understand that you are great and you are mighty and you are worthy of all of our praise, all of our lives, all that we are. Lord, help us to trust you. When your answer to us is no, help us to realize that you know better than we do. Father, when your answer is slow, help us to have patience and to learn to wait on your timing. Lord, when your answer is grow, help us to embrace becoming who you want us to be. And then, Lord, when you give us that prayer request as we've asked and you've said go, help us to go in your strength and your power praising you for all that you've done for us. Lord, we thank you for Christ, our hope, the one who gives us new life. We pray it all in his name.